If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Wow. Wow. Yeah, reading that verse got me in a lot of trouble many times with a lot of believers. I want to talk about three myths about embracing intentional sin that many believers are getting in trouble with and will be to their spiritual demise if they don't consider changing their beliefs. I want to talk about that at the end of this lesson, so don't forget to watch that. Three myths that about intentional sin that we're missing and this is kind of hidden on that door. Deliberately keep on sinning. So some of the questions we want to ask you in this lesson is answering this lesson is how is intentional and unintentional sin seen by the father? Yes, that's a difference between unintentional and intentional. What sacrifice is there for intentional sin? What three myths has man created regarding sin, which I mentioned earlier? What is the condition of the believer who returns back to a life of intentional sin? after becoming a true believer. And how does Yeshua teach believers to handle known sins in their life? You may be thinking, okay, that's me. There are some sins I know about that I'm intentionally doing. At the end of this lesson, I'm going to talk about what do you do if you find yourself in that situation. I found myself in that situation for many years. And so I want to share this from my heart to you in hopes that listening to these words will not just be interesting, but salvation bearing because we are changing courses and repenting, returning back to the father as we should. First is we, if we go back to the old Testament, there were sacrifices offered in Leviticus. We're going to look at different sacrifices offered for different people. The priests had sacrifices that they needed to offer if they were to sin unintentionally. It says in chapter four, now you always spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, if a person sins unintentionally against any of the commandments of Yahweh in anything which ought not to be done and does any of them, if the anointed priest sins, bring, bring the guilt on the people, then let him offer to Yahweh for his sin, which he has sinned, a young bull without blemish as a sin offering. Notice it distinguishes this sin as unintentional, letting us know that all sins are not covered in this. And we go on to the whole congregation. The same is true. It says now if the whole congregation of Israel sins unintentionally and a thing is hidden from the eyes of the assembly and they have done something against any of the commandments of Yahweh and anything which should not be done and are guilty. When the sin which they have committed becomes known, notice that that's a key point. When they become aware of it, then the assembly shall offer a young bull for the sin and bring it before the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. We go very deep into this lesson because it also shows us how Yahweh sees sin and how he imputes different punishments or uh, uh, requirements for the sacrifices, depending on who did it. So we have the priests, the um, anointed priest, the high priest, the whole congregation is sinning. We have the leaders when a ruler has sinned and done something unintentionally against any of the commandments of Yahweh, his God, and anything which should not be done and is guilty of his sin, which he has committed, comes to his knowledge. There it is again. When he realized it, that was unintentional. He shall bring as an offering a kid of the goats, a male without blemish. Or if any one of the coming people sins unintentionally by doing something against any of the commandments of Yahweh and anything which not ought to be done and is guilty. Or if his sin, which he has committed, comes to his knowledge, then he shall bring to his offering a kid of the goats, a female without blemish, for his sin, which he has committed. Now, looking at those cases, you can continue to read on in that chapter, but what you will not find and what is strikingly absent in these passages is what about the offering for intentional sin? These are if someone accidentally, unintentionally did something and it came to their knowledge later. But what if they're actually sinning unintentionally? Why? No offerings and sacrifices for that. Why is this absent? Well, the truth is these sacrifices were not meant to cover intentional sin. The whole goal was for no one to actually commit a sin they knew was wrong. And that may be shocking to most because many believe that I'm a believer, 
I'm here now in salvation. I'm covered by his blood and I, I still do these things. But he says there's no intention of sin. Sure, we're going to, based on where we're born, we're not holy enough to approach God. So we need to be covered and atoned for. But we, we should not be engaging in intentional sin. Why the absence? Because we see later in Numbers 15, anyone who sins defiantly, and that word is translated differently depending on your translation, defiantly here. Another says presumptuously. In essence, when you look at this word in Hebrew, it's with a high hand. It's with an audacious and audacity that says, I know what I'm doing and I'm going to do it anyway, although I know it's wrong. Whether he was native born or a foreigner, he blasphemes Yahweh and must be cut off from the people of Israel. Wow. Now we take blasphemy very seriously. Anyone who knows the New Testament passages that talks about anyone who blasphemed the Holy Spirit. So this word is blasphemy is strong because we want to stay away from it. But Yahweh equates this type of sin to blasphemy because they have despised Yahweh's word and broken his command. I despise his word. I love his word. Despise literally means you've hated his word. Notice he does not care what comes out of our mouth. The honor we give with our lips that says, I love you. I love your word. No, you're despising my words if you break commandments and you know that these are wrong. I've heard it said many times from friends, family members, and even myself. We've justified it about how I know, but I'm going to do anyway. They must surely be cut off. Their guilt remains on them. There's no sacrifice for that. This is how serious it is to no longer walk intentionally in sin. This must no longer exist. There was no sacrifice for that. It's like premeditated murder or premeditated sin. This is premeditated is of an action, especially a crime thought out or planned beforehand. You already knew about this and we got into it anyway. So what sacrifice remains for deliberate sin. Well, that's what we opened up with, wasn't it? We looked at Hebrews that says, if you deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left. There's no sacrifice left. But only what? A fearful expectation of judgment. So in place of the sacrifice for sins, you're going to find a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire. That will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. This is a serious thing. Now, I know you're probably thinking, well, that was Old Testament when I was looking at Leviticus. But we see now in Hebrews, this is New Testament saying the same thing. You're deliberately keep on sinning deliberately. Notice that word is put there in opposition to unintentionally. Stop thinking that you're OK. If you're living and walking in sin, we should be in fear. Why? Because there's nothing else to expect, but it's fearful expectation of judgment. If we're doing this. God cannot be mocked. God cannot be mocked. I always like to say this phrase. He's not our mom and daddy. He's not our teacher and authority. He's not our bosses. And I say that because we get over on people all the time, don't we? Right. We can trick people. We can. They can't read our minds and our hearts and intentions. They really don't know the depths of our lives and we can deceive people easily. But I can tell you one thing. You can never mock God. Paul says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. Why did he say don't be deceived? Because some are thinking that they're actually getting over on God. They're mocking God and saying phrases like I'll change later. Who said you're going to be here later? Don't mock him. I know what to do, but I'm, I'm not going to do it until another time. And all these little phrases we give ourselves. Don't be deceived. Why? A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. And whoever sows to please the spirit will, will reap eternal life. It finishes. God shows no favoritism with this. I'm humbled when I see some of the greats in the scriptures, whether it be Abraham or uh, Isaac, Jacob, um, uh, Moses, when he hit the rock, when he was told to speak to it, couldn't go into the promised land. I mean, on and on and on. I'm like, this is Moses. This is your boy. This is the one who was most, has the most humble heart and you used to say, he said, it doesn't matter. 
You reap what you sow. And God dispenses that judgment. David, a man after his own heart, couldn't build this temple. Lost his uh, son to Bathsheba because of adultery. You reap what you sow. Don't think you're getting out of this clean and getting over on God by intentionally sinning. Some would say, but there's no condemnation in Christ. I had a conversation with a gentleman, and as soon as I considered this line of thinking, he quickly reminded me that there's no condemnation for those in Christ. So we're fine. Romans 8 says, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are Messiah Yeshua. Because through Messiah Yeshua, the law of the spirit who has gives life, who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Oh, the one thing we need to point out here is that there is a condition. There is no condemnation for those in Yeshua, for those in Christ. That's the condition. We must be in Christ. We must abide in Christ. Then there's no condemnation. We assume that because we had an experience as a child or a few years ago or a few moments ago, whatever it was, and we had something spiritual happen, we decided to repent and change and confess. And maybe that was all good. But we must continue to abide, live and be in Christ. If we're going to claim that promise, we miss that part. And that's why we see here. These words says uh, uh, gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. If you're living according to the flesh and its desires and its wants and its temptations, he says, that is not the group I'm talking about. Who We do not live according to the flesh. Such people are not in Christ. I know we might be getting a little uncomfortable because anytime I've noticed someone challenges their relationship with God, it gets really dicey. But I'm only wanting to go back to the scriptures. I, for myself and for all of us, I'd rather be challenged in this life than have to face God in the next and his wrath because I would not listen. So examine yourselves, as Paul says, test yourselves to see if indeed you are in the faith. Are you living according to the flesh and following his desires or are you living according to the spirit? If you're living according to the spirit, you are in Christ. But if you are following his desires and continuing to walk in intention of sin, you might have to reconsider where am I really just between you and God. Yeshua said the same when he was talking about those needing to be in him. In John 15, I'm the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I am in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Notice the condition again. If you remain. A lot of times we don't want to consider that if part, that condition. That if suggests that you can leave, you cannot remain we put all of our stake and all of our, we hang our hats on something that happened at some point in the past. But the question is, have you remained steadfast? Have you continued to grow and continue to repent as you become more aware of sin in your life? Remain in me and I, and I, and you, you will bear much fruit. Verse six, it says, if you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Notice the contrast of those who remain in him that versus those who do not remain in him. I am confronting this idea that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. We cannot claim that there is no condemnation for us if we are not walking in Christ. If we are among these branches who have decided not to remain in him. If we're only going to wave the flag of, I believe in Jesus. I believe in Yeshua. And I believe he died for my sins. Thinking that that statement and that belief alone is what's saving us. 
I want to remind us what the scriptures say. And that when the audience heard belief, it was not a mental assent or an agreement to something. It involved the actions that we see here. Remaining, actually walking in his righteousness, not living in sin. This is to my father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Again, not by knowledge, not because I know of Jesus. I know of Yeshua. I know of God and I know what the scriptures say. But showing yourself to be my disciple, which literally means a learner and a follower of Yeshua. I'm walking in his steps. I'm not veering off to choose my way. I'm denying myself like he denied himself the temptations, the desires, the sins to continue to walk with him. Yes, I know I hear it. We're never going to be perfect. We're not. But God knows very clearly when we're choosing to be in intentional sin. And we know so we can get into arguments with one another about, well, this is not what I was intentionally in God. He knows my job is to share as a messenger and let that sit where it lies. Because I realized a long time ago, uh, as I sat down studying the Bible for the first time over 20 years ago to read these things, that I, I was trying to show those who were studying the Bible with me that I was righteous, that I was a good person, that I hadn't done drugs, I hadn't cussed or I hadn't done all these things. And then I realized, who am I fooling? In a little while, I'm going to have to face God. None of these people will be here. He knows exactly I have not been a uh, herald for his name. I have not been sold after him. This is silly. Who am I fooling? I'm going to look like the idiot. So I encourage us to take such an attitude of seeking truth because in a little while we'll have to face God with that. James says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God for God cannot be tempted by evil. Nor does he tempt anyone, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own own desires and enticed. Then when desires conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin when it is full grown gives birth to death. This is a decision that is made, conceived, gives birth to, and has the rightful consequences of death. This is not unintentional. We actually decide to go along that path, or we can choose not to. How much intentional sin is allowed? Like, how much can I actually do and still be good and still be okay? Right. Because I have this balance in my head that says I do about 90 percent good. And, you know, I stumble here now and then and I feel pretty good. And I give myself a proverbial pat on the back and say, I'm doing better than I did before. I'm doing better than most. Man, I'm doing great. Wow, this is amazing. But how much sin is allowed? First John three gives us an idea by saying whoever abides in him does not sin. I'm just reading the scriptures. So someone I know probably gets mad at the message. I'm just reading the scripture. He just said anyone who abides, meaning to live, meaning to be in him, as we talked about those who are in Christ, anyone who lives in him does not sin. So if you're chasing after sin, pursuing it, if it's on your mind and you're going after, he says, anyone, if you're living in him, you don't do that. Why? Because that's not where he's going. Completely different path. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. So if, if you're saying, if I'm saying, if any of us are saying, I know him, I know Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. I know Yeshua. I know his Torah. I know his law. And yet we are pursuing sin intentionally. He says, you're a liar. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. Again, see, he's talking about not just believing but saying, no, you practice this. You walk this out. He who sins is of the devil. What? John, we all, we're not perfect. We're going to sin. Notice that he keeps making this explicit uh, uh, statement about if you sin. And he's likely not talking about unintentional sin because we're all going to have unintentional sin. But if someone is deliberately intentionally sinning, he says, he who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For the purpose the Son of God was meant for this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. Does he need to say it again? For his seed remains in him. He cannot sin because he is born of God. He cannot. How much sin? None. 
None. At least no intentional. Unless I just, we don't know about it. So let's stop this conversation in, in ourselves and among each other that gives all kinds of passes for those, for, for, for ourselves and for others who are walking in intentional sin, completely doing things over and over again that we know do not glorify the Father. For we take his name in vain by doing so, claiming his character, but living something completely different. If you practice sin, you won't get in. Galatians 5, it says, um, I, Paul right here outlines some of the works of the sinful nature in case we needed to see them and get an idea of what they look like. It's not a comprehensive list, but it gives us a good idea. He says, now the works of the flesh are evident, which are idolatry, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentious, jealousies, jealousies outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, reveries, and the like. Yeah, I want to pause at the and the like part because sometimes we look at lists and if you want to sin, you start saying things like the Bible doesn't say and you're already in trouble because you're no longer pursuing what's right. You're pursuing what's wrong. You're trying to keep from doing what's wrong instead of pursuing what's right. He says all the things like this. See, in 2024, we've invented ways of doing evil. So they don't even make this list. He couldn't even imagine. We've invented new things. He says, stuff like this too going on of which i tell you beforehand just as i told you in a time past those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of god it says it from the beginning to the end of the scriptures please brothers and sisters friends family whoever watches this do not be deceived in thinking that we can continue to practice in any of these sins or those like them and think that we have an inheritance once we take our last breath, that we, we, we have nothing to look forward to but fearful judgment and the wrath of fire. As the scripture say, I'm not making any of this up. Do those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. We cannot practice this sin. So what three myths, three myths I want to discuss that many believers have connected to that are getting them in trouble when it comes to sin. The good news, is if you're still listening to this, you still have time. But let's look at these three myths so we make sure this doesn't apply to us. Number one, grace covers my life of willful, intentional sinning. Why? I amazing grace. How sweet the sound. We need it. Whether you're trying hard or not, your actions will not save you. I absolutely. And that's where grace comes in, because even at our best, even if we don't intentionally sin, we still need the grace of Yahweh. In order to have any chance of approaching him, it's through the blood of Yeshua that even allows for that. It was burnt offerings and such that allow for it in the past where they could come to God and say, I haven't done anything, but let me get this started because my my natural state isn't good enough. Since the fall of Adam and Eve, we got to get back right. Grace covers my will, life of willful, intentional sinning. I'm good. And we walk around in pride. And our chin's up in the air, committing sin that we know is wrong and still claiming the graceful blood of Yeshua. Be careful. That's a myth. Why? Because let's go back to the same verse we looked at earlier. But let's look at the last part of it. It was talking about if we deliberately keep on sinning after we receive the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses die without mercy on the testimony of two or three. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the son of God underfoot, who has treated as a, as an unholy thing, the blood of the covenant that sanctified them and who has insulted the spirit of grace. Oh, wow. So grace, the very grace that we're claiming is saving us, we're actually insulting. And, and, the, and the author here paints a very grotesque picture of one trampling the blood, the covenant blood that we claim, trampling on it by intentionally, deliberately sinning. I'm going to do it anyway because I have grace. I'm going to do it anyway because I have grace. He says, do you, are you serious? 
Do you think you have anything to look forward on when you basically spit on the spirit of grace and trample the, the blood of uh, the son of God? You don't hear this lesson. The lesson that you hear often, the message is we're all covered. We're all happy. We're all in grace. Live and and, 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 and whatnot. And we make mistakes unintentionally, did not know. But too many are just outright living intentionally in sin. I need to outline also that he's talking to believers. This is not talking about the world. Some of us love to look at how, yeah, they keep doing that. And those over there keep doing it. He's only talking to the audience is believers. That's why he says they were sanctified. That means to be have made holy. They were once sanctified. They had the sanctification. We hung our hats on. But they continue to deliberately walk in sin. This is not a good state in the end. Romans 5, 20. But moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Amen. And we can stop there and celebrate. See, where sin abounded, which means grew and got more. So did grace. The more grace, the more I sin, the more grace. Right. What are you talking about? That's why I claim grace. So that as sin reigned in death, even so gra grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Yeshua, the Messiah, our Lord. But we got to keep reading to make sure we get the full context of what he's saying, because just a few verses down, he says this. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? That grace may abound. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, see, he cut that thinking off even before it developed. So we should continue in sin that we uh, grace may keep going. That person who's thinking like that is already have turned their backs and no longer is abiding in Christ. But they're living in their flesh and trying to find a way and an excuse and justification for why they can continue doing so. He says, certainly not. Certainly not. How shall we who die to sin live in it any longer? There is the same sentiment again. How is that possible? How can you continue to live in sin? Right. There may be an accident. There may be unintentional, but you're living in this moment to moment, day after day, week after week, whatever it is. I hear the, uh, the words sometimes in myself. I've said that and I hear it often. I'm trying and the, no, he says you can't live in it. Or do you not know that as many of us who were baptized in Messiah Yeshua were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were baptized with him through baptism into death, that just as a Messiah was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should what? Walk in the newness of life. That's where our walk should be. Please don't be deceived. Personally, if you are claiming that you are walking in the newness of life, yet living in sin at the same time, those can, two can't be together. Do not be deceived of celebrities who claim that I am walking in the spirit of God according to the scriptures and living in sin. That's not possible. I can hear people thinking, well, you can't judge. You can't judge. Yes, we can. And we should according to his word. That's why Paul talks about I believe first Corinthians five. He says, I don't judge those outside. But as soon as someone claims that they are in alignment with his word, we have a standard by which to measure. You're saying you're a believer. OK, here's what first John says. You're a liar if you're walking in sin. Here's what Paul says. Cut it off. Walk in the newness of life. There is a standard we can measure for ourselves and for others who are claiming to be believers. Titus chapter two, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Watch this teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously and godly in the present age. The grace of God is actually intended to have the impact of teaching us not to not to follow the ways of the world, not to follow our evil desires. So instead of claiming grace as an excuse while we intentionally sin, grace should have been teaching us to say absolutely not. I'm so enthralled and grateful for his grace. There is no way I could actually commit a crime against my father in heaven now that I know better. So we can no longer say that myth of 
the I'm covered by grace as I intentionally continue to do that which I know is wrong. To continue reading in verse 13, it says, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Yeshua Messiah, who gave himself for us, that he might what redeem us from every lawless deed. He redeemed us, bought us back from all this stuff and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. This is what grace does. It gets us grateful to do what's right. It lets us seek and run away from anything that's ungodly and seek righteousness. And we're zealous to do good works. That's our focus. I'm recalling Paul's words as he talks about just as you used to offer the parts of your body to wickedness. Now do the same for righteousness. We're going the other way. I'm sold out for righteousness and living according to his righteousness. So myth one, grace does not cover. Grace should implore us, encourage us to be righteous. Myth number two, it's better to sin after knowing God than to sin not knowing him. It's better to sin after knowing, right? Because at least you're covered. And and, and, and in some level, that's true because it does cover us. We don't know. You know, we looked at another um, study previously that talked about um, what is sin. And we talked about how if you were really blind, you're not uh, given that guilt or that sin, Yeshua would say. Thank you. I, I'm living in the grace of God. But not for intention of sin. Second Peter says, for if after they meaning those who follow the corrupt desire of the flesh and despise authority. If you go back to the context, you see that the uh, who he's speaking of after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of Yahweh and Savior Yeshua, the Messiah. OK, who we're we talking about. These are obviously people who have escaped the world and its desires. And it was through their knowledge and understanding of Yeshua. And so many of us listening to this, we're saying, that's me. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. I've escaped. So we got the right audience here. And it is possible. It is possible for this to happen. It says they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. What would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. So this myth is not true. It would have been better for them not to know. It would have been better for us not to know. But now you know. Now you hear these scriptures right now. Now you've been in church. Now you read the Bible. Now you've seen it. Whatever your experience was now that you do know, you're held accountable to that. And he says, uh, picking up in 22, but it has happened to them according to the the true proverb. A dog returns to his own vomit. And a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. What an image. This is not okay. I already know it's better that I know God. No, it's not. Now that you know God, you're expected to follow him according to what you have known. In Hebrews 6, 4 says, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. Again, talking about those who are sanctified believers. I can't remember. I can't uh, tell you how many times after reading such scriptures, Many people wanted to distance themselves from this being uh, the audience being people who were believers because it meant uh, it caused problems for their own life to say, well, these people can actually lose their salvation. They can actually forfeit it. They can actually stop remaining in him. All the scriptures are saying so. I don't want to see it. I don't want to hear it. Well, it's true. Just like the person who didn't want to. Admit there was gravity. You can jump off the building if you want to. You don't have to admit it. Um, was it Winston Churchill that says that the truth is incontrovertible? Malice may attack it. Ignorance may deride it. But in the end, there it is. There it is. You can't fight it. For it is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. These are, this is believers here. Right. Enlightened. They partake of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God. Amen. And the powers of the age to come if they fall away to renew them again to repentance. Wow. Since they crucify again for themselves, the son of God and put him to an open shame. 
Now, I nor anybody I've talked to have been able to fully explain who are those who have, quote unquote, fallen away. The, uh, the apostate, the apostasy, those to fall away. I don't know. But to know that there is a point where you can get to and not be able to return scares me to death. Well, I won't say to death, but it does give some sober uh, warning. And it should be in each one of us that says this is a real thing. You can actually have tasted the enlightenment and the, the power of the Holy Spirit and all these beautiful things and 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 fall away, reject it for whatever reason. Now, um, some may say nothing can be it can be taken from you. You can no one can take away your salvation. And that's not applicable here because we're not talking about anyone taking anything from us. We're talking about us forfeiting the grace of God by choosing to live a life that is not in alignment with his will and his grace. Matter of fact, it would be considered rebellion, wouldn't it, for us to refuse to do what you know you're supposed to do. If you didn't know any better, it's like a child. How can they rebel against something that they didn't know was wrong? But as soon as you know, and you say to that kid, don't cross that line. They did that little toe thing and stick their toe out there and test it and all that stuff. That's rebellion. Even your heart to start to do that is your rebellion, even before you touch it. Mark 14, 15, 28 talks about transgressors. So the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and he was numbered with the transgressors. Now, this word, if you go back to the Hebrew, because the Septuagint, which translated the Hebrew to the Greek, this word comes from uh, uh, Isaiah 53, 12. And this is important because I want to connect what this word in Hebrew is actually saying. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul unto death and he was numbered with the transgressors and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. He was numbered with the transgressors. Notice it's a, a, in Hebrew here because it's in the Old Testament with a different uh, number. So let's connect. What is this word Pasha? This word Pasha. What does that mean from the transgressions? It means to rebel, transgress, or revolt. In the theological word book of the Old Testament, we get this definition. The fundamental, the fundamental idea of the root is a breach of relationships, civil or religious, uh, between two parties. And that makes sense because the whole point of Yahweh is to reestablish a relationship with us. It's to reconcile. It's to bring us back. And if there's a breach here, we have a transgressor or a revolt, a rebellion of rebelling. It designates those who reject God's authority and his covenant. Just reject it. See, again, this is not being taken from us. This is being rejected by our words or by our actions and what we choose to do. That's why Romans 1, Paul says, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. See, these guys knew him and they rejected him as transgressors. Nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and foolish hearts were darkened. Now, last myth. Myth number three, Yahweh deserves, desires a gradual reduction in sin, a gradual reduction. You know, man, I came from such a sinful life. I'm going to adopt this 10 step plan to get through this. You know, I'm going to slowly start, start. If it's sin, that's a myth. There is no 10 step plan, no three step plan to sin. You won't get that from scripture of saying, let me dial this sin back slowly and slowly. That comes from man. That comes from the programs that we may see here on the planet. But God didn't say that at all. You know what he said? He said, cut it off. If your hand calls you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It would be better for you to enter into life lame or maimed uh, rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into the everlasting fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into the hell fire. Now, these are the words of Yeshua telling us how to handle sin. That seems so insensitive. Just cut it. You know, this has been attached to me for a long. This is tough. What do you mean? Cut it. Just stop. Just stop. Whatever it is. I'm not even going to start naming things because it's so vast and I want us to focus on one thing. But whatever the sin flavor is of the day, he says, cut it off. If it is a sin, there is no gradual dialing back of it. This is just incomplete. Stop. 
Colossians, Paul says the same. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fortification, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. We get the same language again. You used to live in them. You used to walk in them. Cut that off. Well, I'm trying. You know, I heard one statement. Um, a friend of mine said, well, you trying, you lying. A lot of times we like to hide behind that word trying. Trying leaves the door open, the back door open for us to still come out of. Well, I'm trying. You know how to. And, and, and if we're also struggling. Yeah, well, we trying to just cut it off. If God is that big and good. If he's in us and that he's that powerful, if the songs we sing are actually true. Why does not he have the power to cut it off, to work through us and testify to the world about his power? I wonder if people are struggling with seeing Yeshua because they can't see him through us because we continue, continue to dappling in sin back and forth and receiving the consequences for that. In Romans 8, we hear the same language. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it's not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. This is death. This is not just make it lame. <laughs> this is not a slow strangulation that says I'm kind of getting it there. He says put it to death. Yeshua says cut it off. Nothing remains. In Genesis chapter four, I go back here because God expects us to do this work. A lot of times, you know, um, we pray that he take this away. And God is looking at us saying, I've already given you the power. You stop. And that's why he came to Cain. Right. So Yahweh said to Cain, why are you angry when his brother offered a better sacrifice? He said, why? Are you? He, he got upset. Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well. Will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door and its desires for you. But you sh should rule over it. You should rule over it. Stop making the prayers that God take away something that you want. To, you won't make the step into taking it away. You have all the power and all the energy. You have all the knowledge. There's no one forcing you. There's nothing. We want to wake up and no longer have a desire. Well, if that were the case, there'd be no point in Yeshua saying, deny yourself. Because deny yourself literally means say no to yourself. It's going to be there. You are not in sin because you have a desire to sin because you have a temptation. You're still not in sin. You're good. It's your decision to commit the crime, commit the infraction that makes you guilty and in sin. So we can continue to pray that he takes the desire with that'd be great and easy. But likelihood, he says, you, you got to do this work. He didn't take it away from Cain. He didn't take it away. Even Yeshua prayed, this cup be taken away. I don't want to go through the pain. Take the desire. That I, I still feel this. Well, I have to deny myself and say no. And it's going to feel like death. Put to death, literally, those members of the body. Well, spiritually, put to death the members of our spiritual selves that are causing us to go into sin. Stop it completely. And we can't blame God. He's not answering my prayer. I haven't woken up with this experience that says I don't feel this anymore. That's not right. We have to put it to death. So shall we continue sinning? Of course not. But we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. We're done. First, Peter says, therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done, 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 done with sin. When you get to the point you're suffering in your body, he said, you're done. I went through all this. I'm suffering. I'm done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their in earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, like living in debauchery and lust and drunkenness and orgies and carousing and detestable idolatry. That's enough time. All right. I told you at the end, we'll answer this question. You might be convicted at some point at some scripture to say, okay, I know that's me. What if I have sin? Do I only have 
damnation to look forward to. Do I only have this fiery end? What do I do? So, remember this story of the woman caught in adultery? That's intentional. That was an accident. Oops. You know, that, that happens intentionally. And what? how do Yeshua handle this? So they were using this question. They were trying to ask him a question. What do we do with this woman? They were trying to trap him. In order to have a basis for accusing him, but Yeshua bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stopped. He stooped down and wrote on the ground. Let anyone, first of all, you know what he did? He said, don't, don't you worry about what everybody else is doing. Anybody else? Everybody else got some issues. You just don't know about them. So, and he went on. At this time, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first until only Yeshua was left with the woman still standing there. Yeshua straightened up and asked her woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Yeshua declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. What is that? Seven words? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight words. So it's so poignant, so succinct, so clear. Someone caught in the tension of sin. She's still alive. She still has a chance. The word that he gave her, and I believe he's given to you and I, go now, 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 and leave your life of sin. Stop. We, there is still hope. You heard this message. You know the, you know the scriptures and how God sees intentional sin. He says, stop and turn. One other story with a 38-year invalid. Um, he rose, he allowed him to walk after 30 years. And after Yeshua found him in the temple and said to him, see, you have been made well, sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. Look at that. Sin no more. Same, same uh, sentiment, same message. Stop sinning. In this case, he said, for something worse happens. He was getting, there were some things that was happening to him in this life because of his sin. Stop sinning. And there's other steps you want to do and pursue righteousness. But, and that was my last lesson about righteousness. But first, stop sinning. Stop doing intentional sin. There is still hope. But after hearing this lesson, you're even further convicted. And you're further convicted as guilty. Because now you know even more that how he feels about it from his text, from his scripture. Grace, the idea won't work. I know God and I'm covered by his blood. No, unless you're a body. Let's summarize our lesson. Yahweh makes provisions for unintentional sin. Amen. He makes provision. He knows that we're going to unintentionally sin. We're human beings. That's what we're supposed to say. I'm human. Unintentional. We're not supposed to say I'm human. I continue to do things I know is wrong um, because with his spirit, we don't have to live like that. There is no sacrifice for high handed sin, deliberate, presumptuous sin. Um, the only sacrifice we have now is through Yeshua. Back then, there was no sacrifice that he offered that we could see. But now he says, come, you can be restored. You can be renewed. You can be reconciled and made one with the Father. And that's a beautiful thing. We should jump on that opportunity today. Stop the video and repent and say no more. I don't know what it is for you that's convicting you or stirring you up. Who you need to share this with that's religious, that goes to church, that does all these things. And we need to be reminded. We need to learn for the first time. Grace is not a ticket for sin. Stop using it as a ticket for sin if we are. And saying, well, I'm covered by his grace. Grace will actually teach us to say no to sin. Grace teaches us to say no to sin and temptation. It's worse to return to sin after we know the truth than it was before we even knew it. The father's sin allowance for his people is zero. Zero. Well, I can do a little bit. I've been doing so great. Zero. There's no intentional sin. His allowance for intentional sin to say, okay, well, zero. That's why First John says, Am I right this so that you will not sin? Put it to death. Cut it off. All the language. Nothing makes provisions for one who decides that I'm just going to choose to do something I know is wrong. Sin should be cut off immediately, not gradually. Immediately. Never to return again. 
We are responsible. We are responsible for putting sin to death. We should not put that in God's hands and say, you take it. You deal with it. He says, you deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. Those are all imperatives that have to do with us doing our part. Rebellion is knowing. Rebellion is knowing but refusing to do. You know it. You refuse to do it. You are living in rebellion and hostility to God. We just have to acknowledge that. If you have deliberate, intentional, willful rebellion that you practice, take heed to the words of Yeshua while you still can. Go now and leave your life of sin. Sin no more, lest something worse come upon you. Sin no more, unless something worse come upon you. Now you've heard these words. And may Yahweh bless the hearers and doers of his words. And may he has grace and mercy on us all. I'll see you next lesson.